remain. Or preach on this thought, strengthening the things which remain. Now, this church of Sardis is one of the seven churches in the book of Revelation. And I believe to rightly divide and understand the book of Revelation, uh, we have to look back in chapter number 1 and verse number 19, uh, where the Lord told John, write the things which thou hast seen. That's your first duty. Then write the things which are. That's your second phase, your second chapter. And then the things which shall be hereafter. There's a threefold division naturally in the book of Revelation. And if you don't get this, if you just mix it all up into a hodgepodge, you won't understand the book of Revelation. Number one, in chapter number one, he says, write the things which thou hast seen. That was his experience. I was in the aisle which is called Patmos for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. And John had a personal experience with the Lord there in chapter number one. And then he said, write the things which are. Chapter number two through chapter number three lists seven different churches. And those churches represent the things that are right now. And that is the church age that we're living in. God gave Paul the understanding of the mystery of the church. The church is not Israel. Right. Israel is not the church. Right. God said neither Jew nor Gentile, the church of God. And whether you're a saved Jew or you're a saved Gentile, you've been placed into the body of Christ. Jesus declared, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The book of Romans tells us there will be an ending of the times of the Gentiles. Then God's going to turn back to Israel again. I know there's been an upheaval and a revival of this replacement theology. And they say that God is finished with physical Israel and she'll be no more. But there are a lot of promises that will be left unfulfilled if right. he's finished with Israel. Right. Because God made a personal promise to Abraham. Yeah. A personal promise to Isaac. A personal promise to Jacob. That one day they would inherit all of that land. And the Lord told the Sadducees, whenever they were disputing the resurrection, he said, have you not read? I am the God of Abraham the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. I am not the God of the dead. I am the God of the living. When Abraham died, he died having not received these promises, the Bible says. On the parcel of ground, he all was that little parcel where he and Sarah were buried at. They're just out of Hebron. I've been there to that grave. And that's all that he owned. But God said, it's all yours. I'm going to give it all to you. Well, he didn't receive it. And so therefore, in order for him to receive it, God's going to have to raise him up. And the Lord Jesus said there will be a day when they'll come from the north, the south, the east, and the west. And they'll sit down in tables with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. God's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. And he will raise them from the dead to fulfill that kingdom in the great thousand year or millennial reign. But from there, between there, from Pentecostal now, is the church age. And I believe that is described in Revelation chapter number uh, 2 and chapter number 3 in these seven churches. And the Lord has an individual message for each of these churches, but I believe there is a prophetical message involved with that as well. The third aspect of that verse is the things which shall be hereafter. Right. And if you look at chapter number 4 and verse number 1, he says, after this, after what? After those seven churches are mentioned and the history is laid out. After this, I looked and behold, a door was open in heaven. And the voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Hereafter. Now here opens the hereafter section. The hereafter. After the church age. After the trump of God sounds. And the dead of Christ rise first. And we which are alive and remain. Will be caught up together in a moment. The twinkle of an eye. When this corruptible will put on incorruption. This mortal put on immortality. Thank God all the church will be gathered up. And we will go to meet him in the clouds. 
Thank God for the day that will be when the rapture takes place. I hear some say, well, I don't believe in the rapture because the word rapture is not in the Bible. Well, the word Bible is not in the Bible either. Amen. But we know what the rapture is. It's the catching away of the church, the harpooning. And for all the truths and doctrines, God has Old Testament types to fit that. And we find out that Enoch walked with God and he was not. God took him out prior to the flood. And then we find that Elijah was another man that was raptured out. And that was prior to the captivity. I'm glad, thank God, the church is going out of here. And I'm a pre-tribulationist uh, preacher. I believe the church is headed out of here. And we're not looking for signs. We're looking for the Lord to come. Right. Nothing has to be fulfilled. Nothing else has to be brought together. Though it is being brought together. But praise God, when he finishes up with it all, we're headed out of here. Hallelujah. Right. Now. I want to get to my subject tonight in verse number three concerning the church in Sardis. And if you study these individual churches, God has a message for each one. And uh, it's something that in the introduction to all of these churches, God gives them a portion of his name and his nature. And whatever that name or that part of his nature is, it will be the answer for the need of that church, whatever it might be. In this situation, we see in verse number one that he said, Write these things, saith he that hath the seven spirits of God. Now this church was dying and it was spiritually dead. Well, what's going to be the cure for that? Get full of the fullness of the Holy Ghost of God. The seven spirits of God. The complete work of the Holy Ghost. There's not seven Holy Ghosts, but Isaiah 11, 1 and 2 describes for us the seven different aspects of the ministry of the Spirit of God. And he's talking about the complete work of the Holy Ghost of God. Now he's going to list seven things that he wants them to strengthen that they already have, that remain. And he says, you be watchful, you guard this, you strengthen those things. Don't let this pass, don't let it go. Uh, don't hold it loosely, don't set it aside. And with each one of these, it takes the strength of the Spirit of God for us to retain and to walk in, to preach, to believe, to practice, and for it to be a continual thought of the creed and the practice in our lives and in our ministries. Now, in verse number one, he tells us that we, uh, that they have a name, that they live, and they are dead. Everybody looked at them, and they claimed they had a name of life, but he said they are dead. I want to say, first of all, we're to strengthen the doctrine of salvation. Just because you belong to the church of Sardis didn't mean that you were alive spiritually. Right. And just because you've got your name on a church roll or been baptized or you carry the tag Baptist or whatever else denomination, it doesn't mean that you are saved. Right. And today we have let down our guard in regard to salvation. Yes. It's easier to join a Baptist church than it is a Masonic lodge. Right. It's easier to join a Baptist church than it is to get your driver's license. And there's very little examination in regard to salvation. And as a result, we have filled our churches up with Ishmaelites instead of the promised sons, Isaac. You remember Abraham. He got all in a wand. His wife sicked him all. Said, God's thinking too long about this thing. And uh, they got impatient. Said, you go into Hagar, we'll have a baby by her. She'll be the surrogate mother. We'll claim that child as our own. And then we will uh, have the promised seed that God's given us. Because I can't have any kids. I, I give up on that. I, I just give up on it. But Abraham did that. Ishmael was born. And Abraham was happy. And uh, Sarah was happy. Until God passed by. Yep. And God told her one day, and him one day, said, uh, you're going to be a father of many nations. He said, oh, that Ishmael might live before thee forever. We're so happy with little Ishmael. And then God busted his bubble. He said, I'm not talking about Ishmael. I'm talking about Sarah's going to be the mama, and you're going to be the daddy. And I'm going to visit you. And Sarah laughed in the tent. And God said, why would you laugh? She said, I didn't laugh. He said, you did laugh. So they called him Isaac, little laughter. Amen. And when she was 90 years 
years old and Abraham was a hundred. Praise God, one frosty morning there was a bump on a baby's bottom and a squall and a scream and people said, have you heard? Heard what? Sarah has had a baby. Oh, you're kidding. How old is she? Why, she's 90 years old. How old is Abraham? He's 100 years old. Amen. Doc, how old are you? 87. You're getting close to Abraham. <laughs> but imagine that. <them. laughs> imagine that. Uh, having a child in the old age like that. It, it wouldn't make you laugh, would it? Yeah. You got a grandma that's 90 years old. It'd make you laugh. But you know what God did? God withheld the natural process of procreation until they were unable in and of themselves and it would take the divine power of God to put life in that dead womb and to bring forth a child and bring forth new life. And God did that so he'd get the glory and he'd get the honor. Right. I want to say, my friend, that salvation is still of the Lord. Amen. Old Brother Jonah had to take a submarine ride to figure that out. God told him where to go, and he said, no, I'm not going there. I'm not cooperating. And so he got paid the fare. He got on the boat. He wound up in the belly of the well. But after he got tired of smelling all that gook in that well's belly, he finally coughed it up in his prayer, and he said, all right, salvation is of the Lord. And the well said, I can't hold you no longer. And threw him up on the seashore, and he went through one of the most wicked, ungodly cities of the day and the history of the world. And he preached the message and didn't even give a stanza of just as I am. <laughs> Yet 40 days, never's going to fall under the judgment of God. Yet 39 days, judgments are coming. Yet 38 days, judgments are coming. And the old king heard that, rung his bell. He declared a fast from the throne all the way down to the beast of the field. And they got on their knees and begged God to forgive them. And God turned in mercy and he saved that outfit. But if you can't read Jonah and realize salvation's of the Lord, you're a blind man. Amen. I want to say even today, salvation is of the Lord. I mean, if we heard testify this week, you hung around church, you've been around the message, or maybe somebody had given you that word, but then all of a sudden, the quickening power of the Holy Ghost got a hold of you, and you got eyes of understanding and illumination that you never had before, and you was able to see. I, listen, there never was a time in my mind that I didn't believe in the gospel from the time I was a little boy. But sitting under that gospel tent that night when the message was preached, it was like God sat down in my lap and boxed me up in a bubble and turned the lights on and I saw myself doomed and damned and on the road to hell, lost and undone. And when I fell in that altar and just prayed that simple prayer, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Uh, praise God, something took off. There was a breath from heaven that came down in my soul that had never been there before. There was a life of God that came in my heart that transformed and Change me. They didn't have to hunt for me the next week to want to go to church. Nobody had to take a Bible and, and wrap a cord around my hand and say, You read this? No, I had a hunger and a thirst because wherever there's life, there's desire, there's appetite, there's longing. And when you really get saved by the grace of God, you become a new creature in Christ Jesus and your life is changed because He moves on the inside. He said, don't put up with this business of having a church. You've got a name, but you are dead. God's people are a lively people. We have a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Don't give up on that message of salvation. And I know you believe that around here. And I just want to confirm it and say, you're right. You're right. You're right. Keep believing it. Keep preaching it. Don't put up with this dead religion and decisionism Amen. and replace that, my friend, for true salvation. Amen. Nicodemus, when God got ready to preach on the new birth, he pulled out the most moral religious man in the whole community. If I'd been preaching on it, I'd grab no legion up, held him up, shook him, said, you must be born again. Or I went down and got Mary Magdalene, brought her over there and said, you must be born again. But instead, the Lord got Nicodemus, the most religious, moral, honest man in the whole community of the Jews. And he looked at him and said, you still like something, you must be born again. Because that which is born of flesh is flesh. That which is 
born of spirit is spirit. And the only way that you can be born of the spirit of God is by the power of the Holy Ghost of God. Amen. Amen. Yes, sir. Strengthen that. Don't give up on it. Keep living. Keep preaching. And you know the blessing of it is such a blessing to hold forth the word of life. And then watch God quicken hearts, That's convict right. them, Amen. bring them to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I don't know what the times I preach, preached on hell as hot as I can preach it, and have sinners sitting there, and you know they're lost. They go out and shake your hand and say, What an exhilarating message. <laughs> I've seen whales. It really was. Preaching for Brother Lemuel. And uh, you remember that family, Brother Lemuel? And uh, they, they went out of there. He's lost. Uh, it's Sam's husband. He lost as a goose. He got preached on hell that night. Boy, old Sam was afraid that uh, he would never come back. And he told her, said, oh, that was the most uplifting message that I've ever heard. <laughs> he didn't get saved. Then he got saved later on, though. But you know what? I look at that and I say, who can save but God? It's not psychology. It's not manipulation. It's not a mental massage. It's not a, a, a man that's able to persuade. We, we preach and we try to persuade. Almost I persuade us people. We just come to that almost point. But the Holy Ghost can persuade. Yes. And the Holy Ghost can change and transform. Yes. Hallelujah. So, strengthen in salvation. Then look at verse number four. Strengthen in separation. Thou hast a few names. Even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Now the garment, it represents what you are. The garment's outward. You know, if you come in here, you've got a, a white uniform on, white bell bottoms, got a little beanie hat on the top, some stripes on your shoulder, I might think you belong to the Navy. You come through that door, you got a blue uniform, a little badge, maybe a pistol on the side. I might think you're in the army. You come in here dressed like a harlot, I might think you are a harlot. Amen. Right. That garment is that outward testimony of who you are. And separation has to do starting with the heart. Yes, sir. Because if the heart's not right, the outward's not going to be right. Though you can have on the phylacteries and the garments and all that and still not be separated. But I'll tell you something, friend. It goes deeper than just on the inside. It flows to the outside. And in this modernistic church age, people have tried to divorce the dress of God's people on the outside with separate. Well, it's all a matter of the heart. Yeah, it sure is. My friend, if you're not right on the inside, you're not going to be right on the outside. Right. And you're going to buck and you're going to kick against it. And there's going to be a warfare in your heart and you're not going to want to submit. I know right now a young lady that she's raised, she wore dresses all of her life. I praise God for that. And now, since she's away from her mama and her daddy, she's by herself, she's got to live tight blue jeans. And I have to deal with the situation where she's at. And I, I just turn my head, walk around her. I don't even want to walk behind her. It's like, you know, two turtles are fighting each other. It, and I say, good night alive. What the world's going on? You need to back up to a mirror. You need to bow down to a mirror. Say amen right there. Amen. And it has nothing to do with that. I hope it has a whole lot to do with a whole lot. Right, Separation. Amen. I was in Sardis. I got to go there and preach through Turkey and went to the seven churches of Asia. Mine are there, and we went to Sardis. And it just so happened that day as we were walking around looking at the ruins and all that, uh, this big Mercedes Benz pulled up, and this wedding party was in there. And uh, this lady got out with her wedding dress on, beautiful wedding dress, and had the cameraman, and uh, the fellow, I guess she's going there and all that. So they walked around there getting pictures. Now, it's gravel and red dirt. And her wedding train, you could just see her dress dragging on that dirt. And man, they went around, got all kind of pictures and everything. And I looked at that and I said, oh, my, my, my. And she just got dirt all over her wedding train. There was another vehicle pulled up with another wedding party. They got out. And when she got out, she had bridesmaids there. And the bridesmaid got a hold of her wedding train and held it up so it wouldn't get dirty. And she went over and she got all of her pictures and they put it out around that. They walked around everywhere she went. They picked, she was really careful. 
She didn't have to send hers to the laundry mat or to the cleaners. Right. You know why? Because she was careful about dragging her wedding train through the dirt. And I doubt seriously that first gal would wear that dress like it was down some church aisle somewhere and get married because it had been a disgrace to her to have dirt all over the tail of her wedding garment. And the Lord says this in verse number four, Thou hast a few names in Sardis which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. There's another falsehood that's being preached, and that is that everybody's going to get the same when they get to heaven. The judgment seat of Christ tells us different. Paul said, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. He says, it's not going to be a comfortable thing to stand before God, because those fiery eyes are going to look through us. And there will be wood, hay, and stubble that will be burnt up, or there will be precious stones and jewel and things that go through the fire that will stand the fire. Well, the Billy Canoy talked about 29 different rewards, and the scripture talks about five different crowns that a person can have, and everybody is not going to have the same. There's going to be positions. Yeah, thank God if you're in heaven, you're in heaven, and what a blessing that's going to be. But friend, you'll be well glad that you serve God when you get over on the other side, and there'll be some tears shed if we didn't serve God and we didn't do right. Amen. So he says, hold this fast. Don't let the devil rob that from you. Hold fast this doctrine of separation. Then in verse number two, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. That phrase, watchful. The Lord Jesus coupled it with prayer. Matthew 26, 41, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. And I want to couple that with supplication as well. Be watchful. And how are we watchful? We're watchful through prayer. And prayer is a means that helps us stay on our toes and strengthen the things that remain. Right. Jude says praying in the Holy Ghost. And there goes the name of the Lord that he gives us in the first verse. Connected again to the second part of it. And that is uh, being watchful and being filled with the Spirit in prayer. Yeah. Individual prayer. Uh, congregational prayer. Family prayer. Uh, community prayer. National prayer. I do thank God for our president declaring some national days of prayer. Boy, I think we ought to declare another day of prayer. Amen. And maybe not only praying, but fasting as well across this nation, trying to draw God's people back together again. But he said, strengthen those truths of prayer. I've been in a few real revivals, and most of the time they're preceded by prayer. And if they're not preceded by an abundance of prayer, when the revival does come, there is an overwhelming manifestation of prayer. Got in a seven-week revival meeting one time then. We prayed before the service, during the service. We prayed most of the time from midnight or one o'clock after the services. Throughout the day, those guys wore ivy thickets out and prayed. Man, they, we just pray. It was just the breath of God seeking the Lord's face and looking to the Lord. And God said, strengthen that prayer line. Don't let it down. Don't let the weeds grow up to your prayer ground. Don't let magazines get on top of the rocking chair where you used to rock and pray and call on the Lord. God blesses and God honors through prayer. He says strengthen that. We pray, preacher. Well, praise God. I encourage you to just keep on praying as we know that it'll work. Amen. And then in verse number three, we're to strengthen the doctrine of the truth of scripturalness. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard well, how did they receive and how did they hear? Man, these folk were blessed. They got copies of the original manuscripts. I mean, they had pure word of God there. Remember how you received. God directly gave it to you. Remember how you heard. You heard the man of God unfold this letter and say, you know, the Lord has sent you a word. 
the Sardis this morning, and this came off the inspired pen of the Apostle John, and he's called you by name, and he's got a particular word for us. And praise God, he preached to remember how you received it and how you heard it. Yep. He's talking about the pure word of God. Now, there were attacks on the scripture even from the early days. There were those that wanted to dilute the scripture. There were those that wanted to water down the word of God and to corrupt the word of God. Friend, there's been a great attack of the Word of God in recent years and trying to corrupt it and pollute it. And there's so many newfangled versions out there. I'll tell you, they just keep coming out with it now. They got the neutered version. They've got the, you know, all kind of L-I-T, D-D-T, the uh, N-I-V, the A-S-V, all the rest of it. I thank God I'm not NIV positive tonight. Amen. <laughs> Glad, praise God, I got an old King James Bible. Amen. And you know, I love studying the Greek and the Hebrew and the Aramaic, throw a little child in and all that. I can slaughter all of it. Amen. <laughs> and it's a blessing to hear somebody like Doc uh, uh, expound upon different words and phrases and things like that. But me, I'm not a scholar in, in those languages, but I do know what the Bible says. Amen. And I do know that this Bible works. And I know that God has used this King James Bible in every major revival that the English-speaking people right. have ever known. And I do know this, when people get away from the authorized text, it becomes weak, watered down, and polluted. That's right. I preached in, in France and found out that they use a translation over there that's equal to what the, the NIV would be. And they started it about a hundred years ago. And talking to them, they said, God had sent a revival in a hundred years in France. And I said, oh, so that's why. Amen. Instead of the Ostrovall, which we printed those 350,000 Gospels of John and Romans, they used that loose gone, and, and it's an equal to that. And there's a lot of things that are not in that that are in our Bible. And my friend, as a result, it's watered a lot down. And you know, we asked folk to fast and pray for those three months that we were there. Come to find out, those French churches, they never been taught to pray and fast. And I said, why is that? I started preaching those verses. This guy come forth but by prayer and fasting. And they opened their Bible and said, Oh, uh, that's not in our Bible. It's removed, just like it is in the NIV and the rest of those polluted scriptures. Yeah. We need to remember how we heard and how we received and stayed with the Word of God. Amen. That's simple. I'm a simple-minded man. I like what my great my grandpa used to say. Plain language is easy understood. This King James Bible is real easy understood. Amen. 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 Does it take a scholar to understand the thee, thou, hither, thithers, and fetches? If you don't understand that, you need to go back to the third grade. Amen. And start all over again. All these scholars. I just can't understand it. Yeah. Uh, it's not the problem with uh, English. It's the problem with not knowing the author. Right. Right. You can know the English yes. and not yes. know the author. Remember how thou hast heard who opened your eyes. Right. Who caused it to ring true in your heart. Yep. Hey, listen, before I got saved, I read the Bible with somebody. I didn't get much out of it. But after I got saved, Lord of God, that book came alive. Right. I heard about an old street preacher one time. He threw his hat down over his Bible. He went to run and said, It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! And people gathered up and he pulled his hat off of it and laid his Bible and he grabbed it and he said, The Word of God is alive! And he began to preach on the truth of how the Scripture is alive and it'll speak to heart and change lives. Amen. He says, You keep this Scripture on this. Don't go bypass it. I was reading about King James translators. There was a young fellow one time that was preaching, and he didn't know it, but one of those translators were there in the audience, and, and he took a passage of Scripture, and he said, Now, here are three reasons why this Scripture should not have been translated in this fashion. Blah, 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 blah. Well, after it was over, the elder translator came up to him and said, Son, I heard your three reasons why you said it shouldn't be translated like that. But I want to give you 14 reasons why we did translate it. <laughs> Amen. Oh, I learned a long time ago you can't be a man in his trade. Amen. Well, those fellows were not ignoramuses. 
they were skilled in their life, many like it. It wasn't just it wasn't just one of them, man. All them guys butted heads on this. This wasn't a fly by night deal. We got a Bible. Just believe it, practice it, claim the promises, stay steadfast with it, and don't let the devil move you away from it or rip your confidence out of the Word of God. Amen. Amen. You go off to another school to get your doctorate, they'll be easier. They tell you now that you didn't, you didn't get rid of the old archaic and you get back over there to India and they got a big move put on all that, you know, that King James Bible you can get rid of. Just tell them to jump in the lake. I've already heard the joyful sound and I know what the book says. I'm going to stay with it. The old dynamic equivalent, we want what it says. Amen. Not what you think it says right. or what you want right. it to say. We right. want to know what it says. And that's how the Green James Bible was translated, what it said, not what they thought it might say. King said, uh -huh. I don't want that. Amen. I want you to give me an exact translation of it. Amen. Amen. All right. Hallelujah. <laughs> then he said, I want you to strengthen your doctrine of steadfastness. He said in verse number three, he said, Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast. Hold fast and repeat. Hold fast. Hold fast. We got two football players in here. What position did you play? Be quiet. Defensive tackle. Defensive tackle. What was your object when that running back come running through you? <laughs> Yep, and, and do something with that ball. What would you try to do with that ball? Strip that ball. Strip that ball. From Brandon, what would you play? Offensive line. Offensive line. So you wanted to keep the hole open so he wouldn't lose that ball. That's the object of it. Well, the devil's after stripping the ball from your hand. Yes, sir. Amen. Boy, sometimes, and I've seen him watch these games, some old boy catch one, he'll go to run it, and he'll get all cocky, and he'll go to hold it down here like this, and some old boy come find him and just hit him, and blam, you know, he don't get his touchdown because he got the ball stripped away. What? But they teach you, hold that thing fast for him, lock your arms around him, a good running back, he knows how to lock that ball in there because when he goes through, they're going to be scratching and pulling, and the devil's going to scratch and pull at you and try their, his best to take away from you the good and the holy things of God. And don't think he's not skilled in doing it. You're right. And you watch those times. You watch those fellas. And, and they'll come in there and they'll hit down on it like that. They'll poke up like that. They'll try their best to get them to lose the ball. Throughout Timothy and Titus, hold fast, hold fast, hold fast, hold fast. Hold on to it. Amen. Be dogmatic about the scripture. Yes. Be bull dogmatic about the scripture. Yes. One fellow said, be pit bull all better about the scripture. I lock your jaws on it, sir. Oh, I'm not giving up, not giving in. Amen. Uh -huh. Yeah, I've been thinking about this thing. You know, old Pelosi and Schubert and all them bowing their knee. I remember a story in the Bible where there was the sound of the music. Yeah. And the music played, and they said, and everybody bow the knee, bow the knee, bow the knee. And they did, but the three old boys stood there. They said, maybe you fellas speak Hebrew and you don't understand our Babylonian language. The king said, bow the knees, you're going to burn. He said, no, we understand well. But we've already settled it in our heart. Amen. Our God whom we serve is able. And if he does it, that's all right too. We're still not going to bow our knees. So they throw them in the fiery furnace. But guess what? There's somebody in the fiery furnace with them, and the Lord carried them through. Hallelujah. They did not drop the ball. Oh, Daniel, in his old age, he didn't, he didn't say, well, all right, you passed the need. We've got to do what the king says. So I'll be praying, you know, for this season and time. No, he got on his knees, and he said, we still pray. And he turned his face toward Jerusalem and said, yeah, I don't pray. And they said, ha ha, there's some hungry lions waiting on you, old man. Well, and little old Daniel down, those lions looked at him and said, well, there ain't enough meat on his bones to even nasty your teeth up. He's not worth fooling with. And the angel put the clampers on their jaw. And I'd say, I'd love to go there. And I hope the Lord let me just get a picture of that when I get to heaven and just go back and review that video. I'd see Daniel laying on the belly of one of them big old lions and the flies and the lion swatting his tail, keeping the flies off old Daniel. And Daniel's the only one who got a good night's sleep that night. He was. Because the king walked the floor. Man, he knew he didn't do it. 
and with a lamentable voice. Isn't the Bible descriptive? Oh, Daniel! Live forever, King! <laughs> oh, you know, his hair is still up on the back of his head. Get that fellow out of there! He got Daniel out, and them old lions are saying, hmm, boy, we sure are hungry. That's all right. Praise God, the king gathered up all them corn thin politicians and throw them down. <laughs> no lines got gorged because they patiently waited and didn't eat up God's man. There's a message in there. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Stand fast. Hell, stay with me. Stay with me. He said, hold fast. Then I want you to look at verse number two at the service. Hold fast your service. Strengthen that. He said, I know thy works. Works, that's a good word. We're not working to be saved, man. Wasn't that a walk through? I'm glad we got to walk down through the corridors of Romans chapter number eight. I never get bored of going through it or hearing it and hearing it expounding, especially the way our dear brother did. Just, I just, I, I love an honest theologian. Yeah, that's right. I hate to hear somebody come through scriptures like that and then start. It's like one old fella said he went to a blacksmith shop and he looked up overhead and it said metal bent and twisted here. He said that reminds me of a lot of pulpits and ought to have that over in scripture bent and twisted here. <laughs> And I'm like Dr. Lysenius, praise God, if it's Ephesians 1, 4, preach it. If it's John 3, 16, whosoever preach it. Believe what the scripture says. There's a right hand, there's a left hand. And if you get one out of Kelper with the other, you get what they call vertigo, and you go wobbling on the axle, and that's why we get so wobbly in these days, because we won't just take the book for what it says. We don't have to understand it, we've just got to proclaim it, and God will bring all the things in order. When we get to heaven, he'll straighten us all out. Right. Amen. Amen. But serve, save a grace, marvelous grace, but then save to serve. Work, 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 work. Before you got saved, you couldn't do any works and be pleasing to God. But now God is putting you a new man, a new nature. He's given us the tools, and he says, now get with it. Use the tools. He told Peter, he said, here, I'm going to give you the keys. I can throw you the keys. Now you can walk off if you want to, or you can take them keys and put them in the ignition drive on, whichever one you want to do. It's up to you. And the Lord gives us keys in the scripture that enable us to have power to serve God right. and to follow him right. and to do what God wants us to do. Right. There's the law of the harvest. Nature teaches us. You sow little, you're going to reap little. Oh, God, give me a harvest. Lord, I want corn this fall. Hallelujah. Didn't plow. Didn't plant. Yeah. Didn't do anything. Weeds grow up. Oh, God, why didn't you give me corn this year? And God says, I didn't give you corn because you didn't get out of the bed and bust the ground up, put the seed in, and take care of the weeds and do what I told you to do. And that's why you didn't have a crop. And we can blame everybody and his brother, but if we don't get out and sow, then we can't expect to reap. For he that soweth little is going to reap little. And that's just the law of the harvest. And that's the nature of things in serving God. Amen. Amen. So strengthen our service. Then last of the night, the seventh thing is strengthen our submission. In verse number three, the latter part, he said, Repent therefore, if thou shalt not watch. I'll come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. The Lord said, perk up your ears, repent. And if you won't repent, I'm going to come on you as a thief. And when a thief comes, he don't come to get your garbage. Amen. He don't come to get that meat in the bottom of your freezer, this freezer burnt. He heads to the jewel box. He goes to the gun cabinet. He finds that little packet of money you got stuffed away in a pillar somewhere. He's going to take the most precious things you got. The Lord says, if you won't repent, then I'll have to chasten you. And I'll take away some things that are precious to get your attention. If we judge ourselves, we'll not be judged. But if we won't judge ourselves, 
and God said, I'll deal with it. Right. You raise children, I've raised children. I've been a child, and I remember this as a child. Boy, if I tried to hide something from my daddy, he knew about it before I ever got home. <laughs> my, my, my. But if I just got honest with him, I said, hey, Dad, I was, I was shooting my BB gun a while ago, and, and I didn't mean to, but I busted the window there. Uh, and, and whatever it takes, you know, we'll take care of all right, son. We'll fix it, you know. Everything's okay. But, boy, if I tried to hide it, no, I didn't do it. Tell a lie about it. It's Katie bar the door. <laughs> and it's sort of the same way with the Lord. We'll acknowledge it. And if we confess and confess means to say the same thing about it. God says about it. Yeah. We're trying to justify it. Right, right. We're trying to reconcile it with, well, you know, if, if I, yeah, I, I have the right, and you know, and I, no. I just say the same thing about it God says about it. We confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins Amen. and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so he said, just strengthen that doctrine of submission. Stay under, you know, Laodicea means the people rule. And are we not living in the last days where the people's rights or the people rule? I've got my rights. Funny, the other day I saw a fella standing outside. This white dude had on this shirt, you know, and he's talking about the reparations and all of that for the Africans and all that. And the old boy said, I'm a Mexican myself. He said, you are. He said, yeah. I said, was you born in Mexico? No, I'm born here. He said, my daddy's born here. My grandpa's born here. My daddy served in the Vietnam War. And he looked at that dude. He said, I want my reparations. He said, what do you mean? He said, oh, I'm, a, I'm a minority. I'm a Mexican. I've been in this street. Give me my money right now. Give me my money right now. Got all my rights. You owe me. And that's where we're at. But Christianity is the opposite. Servant. Servant. Paul said, I am a servant of Jesus Christ. Amen. A prisoner of love, willing to come under and in subjection unto him. And that's the attitude of God's people. Sheep are not violent critters. Sheep are submissive, even unto the slaughter. We took a sheep one time to have it slaughtered at Selden Hill Slaughterhouse. And uh, the boy that helped Selden, when Selden got a hold of it, put binders twine on the back of his feet, that boy went running out. Daddy said, what's wrong with him? He said, well, Mr. Bain, said, you ever seen a sheep die? He said, no. He said, well, he has, and he don't want to see another one die. And so he pulled him up, and he held his hand on his mouth, and he took that knife, and he cut his throat, and that sheep let out the most pitiful little old back. And then he reached over there and licked the hand of the man who just cut his throat. That's the nature of sheep. You back an old hog up there now. <laughs> Try that. He's going to squeal and cut you with those tusks and everything else. God's people are submissive people. First to the Lord, then to one another. And we want to be servants. He said, you strengthen that. Don't forget that. Let's stand all over the house. I know this message is just a reiteration of truths that we hold dear, that we know, that we 